So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to a Gen 3 webinar hosted by National Cancer Institute's Data Common Framework Services. My name is Andre Paredes. I'll be the moderator for this event. First, some housekeeping. Um, this event is recorded, so we kindly ask all attendees to be muted um, and remain muted so that we can share this recording after. You can please submit questions to the chat and they'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. So this webinar is titled NCI DCFS Quality Assurance Process. Our presenters for this webinar are Jachi Liu, a tech lead here at NCI DCFS, and Marcelo Costa, a software engineer and test at NCI DCFS as well. So Gen3 um, is a data commons framework services in which DCFS resides with. And because framework services serve control access data on our platforms, we want to ensure all we want to sure we provide reliable and scalable solutions to our users. This presentation comprises of an overview of the processes we follow before release to ensure that DCFS provides a reliable, scalable, and secure way of data access. Just a quick introduction. Uh, Gen3 is an open source solution for operating data commons. NCI Data Commons Framework Services, DCFS, runs an instance of Gen3 Framework Services and Gen3 is built and operated by the Center of Translational Data Science at the University of Chicago. So for today, our agenda is to give an intro on our quality assurance, um, providing some insight on testing pyramid observability, how the code is released, our code release process and our monthly releases, how data is released, data indexing and our GDC replication, and testing, automation, observability, independent infrastructure tests, low testing and long run tests. And then we'll conclude with the managing quality. At this point, I'm gonna hand over the presentation to Marcelo, where he'll talk about the test pyramid observability. Thanks, Andre. So in this slide, we um, just gonna give some basic concepts around QA. Uh, the first one is the test pyramid. And as you can see at the, at the base of the pyramid, we have our unit tests and component tests. These tests, they don't require an infrastructure or a test environment, and they could be executed locally on the developer's laptop, or they could be executed as part of a, a GitHub pull request. Uh, when, the, when the developers are about to deliver their code, then automated tests, they will be executed and instrument their code with fictitious data, and it, it would execute the functions to make sure that the expected output is presented. And, and that's the base of the pyramid because that would provide most of the coverage around the testing because it's not so computation intensive. It could be easily configured and it would be, wouldn't be so expensive to set up. So most of the tests are done in this context. Then in the mid layer, we have the acceptance test. That's the API layer. That's where the code would actually be deployed against a test environment and the services endpoint would be instrumented and we will make sure that all the services talk to each other and behave as expected that with a given input, the output produced by the communication between different components would result in the expected output. Um, and then at the top of the pyramid, we have the GUI test, the graphic user interface tests. These tests, they require not only a test environment, but the automation would also have to spin up a browser. If we're talking about web-based uh, systems, then the browser would instrument the web page and it would make sure that the components that are rendered on the page are presented correctly and all the buttons that the users would click or forms that they would fill, they would take the users to the expected pages and results that uh, we expect our system to reach. And then manual tests, they are executed just to raise the confidence around some key critical features. Uh, definitely manual tests in terms of scalability, it's very challenging. Um, so we try to leverage automation as much as possible. So moving on to the, the image on the right-hand side. So logs and events, they're 
necessary uh, because we can track and understand how our system behave. And by interpreting uh, the log entries, we can come up with the understanding of events, like accessing databases or communicating with other services. And because of the, the advent of cloud-based services and microservices, now, instead of having a single monolithic uh, system or component, but now we have microservices. So we have multiple services components talking to each other. And because of that, tracing is very critical to understand how the communication hops from service A to service B and it fans out into several different replicas and services. And to have observability around all that, you need metrics, um, which are data points that are exposed by the applications and services and the infrastructure to understand how your system behaves and what's it's going on. It could be HTTP requests, it could be service communication with the database or caching systems, uh, pretty much any sort of data point and metrics would be valuable to understand how the system behaves. So that's very important in terms of observing the success of your, your testing and the health of your system. And this slide here illustrates uh, our release process. So we have a monthly release. Friday, that's when we take the code from all the developers across all the repos and we take a snapshot of that point in time and that's going to be our release candidate sort of snapshot. We cut branches across our repositories of code and then we work with that the code that was set at that point in time. The developers will continue working and on that separate streaming lane we would take that code and test it against QA environments. And then after a two week testing round, on the fourth Friday, then we have the code freeze, which we won't take any other bug fixes at that point. And whatever has been tested and fixed throughout these two weeks, that would be set for that fourth Friday. And the Monday that follows that, that's when we actually publish the release. And as you can see in the diagram, uh, we have month A, and then we do the release management for version N. We cut the testing branch, test it for two weeks. Then at the end of the fourth week, we publish that release, and then we move on to this continuous cycle. So in month B, we're gonna be testing release uh, version N plus one, and so on and so forth. The, the release notes, and their manifests and also documentation around known bugs that are not so critical that we document, they can be, find, they can be found in that uh, URL. I'm gonna let Jachi uh, comment on the data releases. Sure. Uh, so much like our code releases, we also do data releases for the data nodes on CRDC. Uh, so data releases will happen as needed for the data nodes and with the, the GDC, um, it actually follows roughly a monthly cycle as well. Uh, for the data release, it typically follows our standard operating procedures for data indexing, which you can learn more on our website. Um, but we also do a couple of validations once the data is made available to us, in particular, when we do a GDC release, we make sure to check that all the IDs referenced in the GDC manifest have made it over into the DCDFS buckets and exist in index D for DCFS. So that is a validation we do after we have copied over the GDC data set and is preparing to make it available to the general public. Uh, we do those validations before we announce that we have completed a data release. For each of the data nodes, uh, it goes through the indexing process. We can choose to do data indexing in the staging environment first um, to be able to do more validation there before indexing in production. And then once we do have the data indexed and uh, appropriately assigned UUIDs in production, uh, we do a couple of sanity checks to make sure that 
uh, the test users that we do have access to can generate signed URLs for controlled access and open access data. And as you can see here, we publish our data releases um, along with any more information on our website. Uh, and this is where you can go to get the information available so that you can access the data. Uh, and you know, same with the code releases, we wanna make sure that with each batch of data being released, um, that we're providing the appropriate metadata associated with the file, that the checksums are there, um, and that they're accessible by the user with the right permissions. Marcelo, I'm gonna hand it back to you to continue talking about our testing processes. Thanks, Jackson. Um, move on to the next slide. Right, so just to dive a bit more into the different types of testing that we perform, um, the, the main one is definitely uh, related to continuous integration. And for those who don't understand the concept of continuous integration, that is basically a practice that avoids the scenario where one developer would write some code and they would say that it's working on their machine. So if everybody just tests uh, their changes individually, they wouldn't be testing against the cohesive set of different modified artifacts across all different repos and the whole system. So continuous integration is basically setting a, a centralized place where all the changes would be combined and will be tested together. So all the developers will deliver chain changes and it will be tested in the centralized location to raise confidence that all these changes combined, they work as expected. And we achieved that by leveraging um, pull request automation and our Jenkins as the orchestrator for the, triggering the tests of all these changes. So when, when a developer um, wants to create a pull request, even before the commit is pushed to GitHub, we have pre-commit hooks to run some security analysis, make sure that the developers would not accidentally push some secret or sensitive information. And there are also, there's also automation around formatting and style of the code to improve maintainability, readability, and once the developers create the pull request, that would automatically trigger uh, an event in our Jenkins that would take that code and it would create uh, a Docker image. It would package this code into an image to be deployed against a test environment. Um, in the process of building the image, we also run more security analysis for common vulnerability and exposures, which is powered by and, and then we execute more unit tests inside the pull request, as explained previously, and more static analysis. When Jenkins identifies these pull requests and deploys these packaged pieces of code into the continuous integration environment, then we run over 300 integration tests, automated tests, acceptance, te acceptance tests, and GUI tests to make sure that that changes okay, it's healthy. And if all the tests are green, then the developer can merge the code into the master branch. And this slide here illustrates one of our test reports uh, that's powered by Allure. Uh, so in every monthly release, we execute some manual tests right before the deployment to our production environment. And this is an example of one of the reports. Um, and just to illustrate, you can see that there are test scenarios involving uh, Google service account registrations, and we have positive tests and negative tests. And this is just highlighting an example of a negative test where we have an invalid service account or an invalid Google project. And we try to instrument our services with invalid data and see if the system responds accordingly. That it should like reject that request. And for the positive tests, it should provide a successful output. Right, so this one, we'll talk a bit about observability. So as we have dozens of repositories and lots of developers working in many, many code changes, our continuous integration pipeline, it has to be monitored for any issues that could be environmental problems uh, in our continuous integration environments that could 
produce a test failure that could not be authentic, or if there uh, a test that is failing more often than the other ones, or even if there are tests that fail intermittently, this would also be known as flaky tests. And because of all these different conditions and situations, we hooked up metrics in our continuous integration environments in our pipeline to have a platform where we can fully observe all of our pull requests and fa fail tests, successful tests, and get a vision of how everything is behaving. And this is quite useful to cherish uh, continuous improvement and make sure that our tests are working as expected. So in this next one, we'll talk about independent infra tests. So some of our tests, they are very uh, computationally intensive and they would require some infrastructure. Uh, and one example that we have here is our bucket manifest generation, and which basically looks into a given bucket, a storage bucket, and it produces a manifest out of every single row, every single file inside that bucket. And for that, it needs to fetch these files and run some computation to gather metadata of every single object. And because it's, it's so expensive to run, computationally expensive to run all that, all these processes, we do not run that for every single pull request as part of our continuous integration pipeline. We have a different swimming lane for these infrastructure uh, processes that involve some heavy computation. And that's just one example that we have there. Um, so moving on to load testing. So in order to keep track of the performance of our systems and services, we run some load tests as, as part of our monthly release. And this is very useful if we want to have some sort of understanding whether our service it's per performing like the same or if there is some performance uh, degradation that is happening over time. If we want to look at our uh, latest uh, monthly release perform, uh, performance test results, then we could compare and contrast and see whether the latency, the slowness of the responses, if they're increasing over time. And it's also very useful to identify uh, performance bottlenecks. If there is a, a given transaction in a service that is taking a lot of time to respond, then we could run load tests to instrument and profile that service to deep dive into it's like inner function calls and understand what is the point where it spend most most of its computation and and once we have a, a a candidate for a fix we can run load tests again to evaluate whether or not the fix was successful uh, examples that we have is the HTTP archiving test uh, that we usually run against our exploration page and pre-sign URL transactions um, to make sure that fans can quickly provide a pre-sign URL back to the user. And for that, we also leverage observability. As you can see, we keep track of all the metrics of every single request and the latency, and we can get uh, an average of response time and and we also run these load tests against uh, a QA or even pre-production environments. And another flavor of load tests, there are long running tests, also known as SOC tests. And for those, we, we use Jenkins to execute a fully automated um, load test against one of our QA environments. And because in order to instrument our services, we have to go through FANCE, which is our authorization authentication service. And as we use an API token that expires by default in 20 minutes, we put mechanisms in place to, after that expires, we continuously just talk to FANCE to renew that token and we can continue running tests for hours. And that's very useful to identify anomalies that would just manifest themselves after like hours and hours of executing the same operation. And, and also to make sure that if we have um, a, 
a large database, we can quickly filter out and query data out of that large database. So the load tests are very useful to create uh, a large amount of data, fictitious data against a testing environment. And just to, just to talk a little bit about the actual technology, basically we use these open source project called K6, which is a which is a tool that allows you to write JavaScript based load testing scripts and and that that's how you define the steps that you want to be executed continuously by virtual users to simulate hundreds and thousands of requests uh, that are being produced by hundreds of users to bombard a given testing environment. Right, sounds good. Marcel, gonna... yeah, yeah, I can uh, take over the, the screen share now. Cool. Um, so, as Marcel talked about, there are various, I guess, aspects to the observability stack. Um, and one of the key points of having all these metrics, um, having logging, is to help you identify issues when they come up. Um, as much as we want to prioritize not have doing all the testing before we do a production release, inevitably something is going to go wrong, you know, at some point in the production environment. So to mitigate that, we want to make sure that we have uh, the ability to manage quality in the production environment and that we are prepared to respond to any issues that might come up. Um, the key part of that is actually identifying those issues as they come up and making sure that we do have monitoring and alerting in place. Uh, so for the monitoring on the DCFS platform, we have a couple of health checks to make sure that services are up and available to users. Uh, we run all of our services on Kubernetes so we also have some custom scripts to monitor for the health of our Kubernetes uh, cluster, the health of our Kubernetes pods, and ensuring that the right services are running uh, as expected. Um, in this screenshot, you'll see uh, a dashboard for a monitoring and alerting a service called Pingdom. We leverage Pingdom to basically continuously ping our website and make sure that it's available and, and it's returning a 200 response. Uh, so this is what notifies us if uh, there is downtime with DCFS. Um, as mentioned earlier, there's also logging available. The logs are useful for, for triaging bugs and issues as they come up. So if we do get an alert for ping them, we'll check the logs to see what could have gone wrong uh, and what do we need to resolve. Um, so the logs provide us with more information so that we can run a diagnosis on, this, uh, on the uh, service. Once we identify an issue, there are a couple of options for us. So if, it's, if there's an issue in production, uh, we can always roll back to a previous working version of the code. So it should always be safe to go back to the previous version that was version uh, working or the previous configuration that was working. Um, so that's usually our first course of action if we determine downtime is can we roll back to a previous version while we continue to diagnose the issue on a non-production environment. Uh, we do also release bug fixes and hot patches, um, but when we do that, we also test them through the QA process to make sure that there's no unintended side effects with the bug fixes themselves and that they work as intended. Um, so it's kind of a cyclical um, process of if we identify an issue, always try to resolve production first by rolling back into a previous working version. Uh, and then investigating the issue in a non-production environment and patching up the fix uh, for a future release. Um, and this monitoring and um, the alerting services are always running in the background to ensure that we have visibility uh, into how our services are operating in a production environment. Um, they're also running in our staging environment just so that production and staging are, are consistent. 
Um, so that's kind of what we wanted to end with, which is this notion of even after all the, the QA processing, you still have to have observability uh, and you, know, you have to be cautious in the production environment too. Uh, if you want to learn more, please reach out to us. Um, a lot of our code is open source, and you can actually find our Gen3 QA uh, repository in our GitHub as well. Uh, and as always, these are the ways to contact us. If you have questions about the QA process or any other topics, please feel free to reach out. And if a as a user, if you ever identify any issues or uh, have something to bring up for um, our features, this is also how you would reach us. Thank you very much, and uh, we would be happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Jachi and Marcelo. So everyone, please feel free to submit questions into the chat box. In the meantime, I will address a couple of the questions that we have submitted currently. The first question is with respect to load testing. Why K6 over other performance testing tools? What other tools, if any, do you, did you consider? I take this uh, one. Marcelo, would you like to take this? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Our Gen3 QA um, repository and our continuous integration uh, framework that was already put in place years ago, it's mainly JavaScript based. So we had to pick a tool that would align with the existing sort of language that all the QA engineers are already have already adopted. So K6, it's a Golang based runtime load testing engine, but it executes JavaScript script. So that seemed like the, the best fit um, for our load testing purposes. Thank you, Marcelo. Another question. If I have a lot of requests to fence, to get pre-signed URLs, how should I do how should I do to achieve better performance? Right. So a pre, pre sign URLs um, in, in, in the fence service, they are somewhat, um, they, they require some computation in the background in order to talk to Google or AWS to actually talk to external APIs and also authenticate and authorize our underlying service accounts to produce these URLs. So because it, it has to reach out to third party cloud services, it, it takes a few milliseconds, it takes some computation and some of the, these requests, if you have a surge of hundreds of requests in the, the short time frame, they could be queued up. So definitely one of the best practices that we have to evangelize is to set up automation to retry these requests, or if you need uh, a large number of pre-signed URLs, that they have to be set up in a batch process where the automation would sleep every few seconds between requests. Uh, and otherwise our service would just reply with a message, message, please try again. And that's a measure uh, involving rate limiting that we put in place, which is a, it's a practice, it's an industry standard, like Google and AWS, they also have rate limiting. And that's basically to protect our system. Uh, so in order to make it resilient, we cannot let a surge of requests stress the system. So we, we have proper rate limiting in place. So the best practice would be to set up a batch process and, and wait between a large number of requests to let, it be, let them be processed correctly by fans. Thank you, Marcelo. And a follow-up to the K6, uh, what other tools were you considered considering? Um, and what other tools exist um, to K6? I think for, for load testing, one of the most famous ones is JNature, um, but it, it's a Java-based solution and 
we're looking for something that would involve more JavaScript because of the, the team's expertise. But um, but if we if we do not have K6, we will probably try something similar to JMeter. Um, yeah. Okay, we have one more question here, and I just want to let everybody know that if you have any more questions, please submit to the box. Um, so how do you measure test coverage? Right, in our pull requests, um, we that executes our continuous integration uh, testing, we, we have a GitHub configuration that would kick off some automated processes to analyze the code and trigger unit tests. And based on the results of these unit tests, the base of the pyramid that we discussed previously, there's a system called coveralls that would give us a coverage report. And, and that would take care of our unit tests. For our integration tests and acceptance test GUI testing, we, we just reference our test reports. And, and the QA team also maintains a, a monthly release testing spreadsheet where we keep track of all our test suites, scenarios, and tests that we run as part of the monthly cycle. Okay, that is all the questions that I have here submitted. So at this time, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Jachi Liu and Marcelo Costa, and I want to thank everybody for attending. <laughs>